recording it. And Foster, you may begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Welcome everybody tonight to a very, very special evening. Uh, as, as every Broadway baby knows, the conventional wisdom was, well, you really can't revive Funny Girl because Funny Girl belongs only to Barbra Streisand. And so nobody ever did it. But of course, we Broadway babies know that isn't true. We know that after Barbra Streisand left Funny Girl, she was succeeded by our special guest, Mimi Hines, who played the part on Broadway longer than Barbara did. Mimi was in it for 18 months and people were not coming to see Barbra Streisand, they were coming to see Mimi Hines give a brilliant performance as Fanny Bryce. It is one of the legends of the American theater. And now with the current revival and first revival ever on Broadway of Funny Girl, isn't it appropriate to have this time to celebrate with the original Funny Girl who gave one of the most famous performances ever on Broadway under virtually impossible conditions, but she did it. Mimi Hines, welcome. It's your first Zoom interview. We're so happy to have you with us. Oh, Foster, you got my tears flowing there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I wanted, We have so much to talk about, but I do want to start with this question. I think yeah. I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. How were you cast in Funny Girl? Oh, uh, from Julie Stein and Ray Stark. Uh, Julie knew our work, Phil and I, and uh, we were on our way to see a show called Bajour, and we were in a taxi cab with uh, our director, Larry uh, Kasha. And Phil said, gee, now, as we passed the Winter Garden, Phil said, there's a show Mimi could do, and I could do it with her. It's perfect for us. It's the life of Fanny Bryce. And Larry said, would you do that? And we said, sure. So then we went off to do our act in Puerto Rico, and we got a telegram that says, come back as soon as possible. You've been cast as the new funny girl, and Phil is the new Eddie Ryan. And we went back as soon as our engagement was over, and I got on the stage and sang a song for Julie, and he knew our work already because of the Catskills. We all worked up there, and he would see us often. And so he said to Ray Stark, see, I told you, she's been to the post. <laughs> <laughs> Did they hire you at that, at that yes. one, first audition? Oh, yes, yes first right. Day. And we started rehearsal, and we opened uh, on the 27th of December, 1966. 65. Yes, 65. Yeah, 65. And you played it straight through to July 1st, 1967. Yes, you yes. You rolled down that stage. Oh, it was wonderful. Months. It was the most wonderful thing that it, it, Phil and I were already quite famous at the moment because we we've been on ed sullivan so many times and jack parr found us and johnny carson took his place and you know we were out there mike douglas and merv griffin and all those should be dean martin so there wasn't anybody that didn't know us in the country and let's not forget that we only had three channels <laughs> On television, those days, right? ABC, NBC, and CBS, and there was um, a, a, one of those uh, side channels, you know, but th that didn't go all over the country like the other major networks. And so, when we got the job with Funny Girl, it was like it was the cherry on the top of our beautiful ice cream that we had from Red Sullivan and Jack Parr, et cetera. And it, and it was what, what we...
Hold on, uh, you went me. for some reason. We've, we've lost the sound. Paris and we the went everywhere. Way. And so Maybe when we- a minute. Mamie, we had some trouble with the sound. Oh. Uh, Mark, are we all right now? I can hear you. You can uh, hear that, me? That, that, that yes. the problem seems to be on her end. So. Okay. Um, the uh, trouble is on my end? Yeah, but we hear you now. We hear you now. Let, let okay. me, let me, let me uh, just go back to after you got the part. How long did you rehearse? One week. One week? Yeah. Had you, had, had you seen the show? We've lost the sound again. I have no control of that. It's on her end. Um, um. I'm not even see, uh, they're starting to hear me. Michael, can Michael come over here? Mike. Yeah. It's it's their internet slow. That's why it's cutting in and out. Our technician, Mike. That why? Okay, try again. Go ahead. There she is. I see you. Okay. You see okay. me? Okay, yes, I do. Uh, okay. You, okay, you had one week of rehearsal. Yes. You had seen the show? Uh, once. Once. Way before we had even dreamed of uh, it coming to us at any time. You had seen the show, but not as somebody preparing for the part. Just as no. an audience member. Yeah. Just what, thought what, it, did, I get... what did you think of the show when you saw it? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. The, the, the Julie Stein's music. Are you serious? How could you not love that? He was one of the best composers that ever lived. I love singing his songs. I love all the songs on the show. And of course, they, they changed some of them for the film because a film is different than stage. So, but I do miss the songs that were beautiful on the stage. They I missed are, them in the they film. Are missed in the film. Uh, when you saw yes. it. Five, five songs were taken out. When you saw the, the Broadway production, yes. did you, as an audience member, say to yourself, I think I could say that I, I recorded it. I recorded some of the songs before we opened. So you, did you have, did you feel an immediate affinity oh, for that yes. role? Yes, absolutely. You knew you knew it was for you. Yeah, my my, my mom used to impersonate Fanny Bryce when I. That's on her end. Oh, we're having a little problem. Yeah. Big star. Run through the night, and we're lost out there in the stars. Are we back up yet? Yes, we're back on again. Oh. During during the rehearsal, the one week rehearsal, who directed you? Larry Kasha. Not Jerome Robbins or Garson Kanan. No, Garson wasn't involved then. And Jerome Robbins wasn't. Um, I think at some moments, out in the uh, sitting out in the audience, not known to me, uh, was um, um, the, our lovely composer that just passed away, Stephen Sondheim. During your rehearsal period. Yes, I know he was out there because he spoke to me of it later when, on in life when when uh, you were being directed did the name barbara streisand ever come up no not you, when, you were never asked to imitate her or do oh anything. no because larry said if we uh, and julie joined him in this if we wanted another barbara we could go out in the stage door there waiting for her out there. You know, all girls that want to be Barbara Streisand. And there were uh, quite a few of them because everybody loved Barbara. 
And so they were waiting out there to get her autograph and maybe do the show. So no, they didn't want an, uh, they didn't want anybody copying Barbara. And of course, I'm definitely not Barbara. I am myself a whole different story, you know. And they, they encouraged your individuality. They wanted you. Yes, uh, and they wanted Phil, my partner, you see, yes. because he was Eddie Ryan, and he loves Fanny in the show, really, truly. And when it was Phil, you felt that love from Eddie Ryan. You felt it when he talked to Fanny and told her her husband was in jail. It was very, very poignant, and I cry every time I think about it. Because it was based in truth, right? It was based in the truth. Yes, based on the truth. It it came from real life. Of Phil as a Ryan. He's in his costume. Can you see him? Yes, very well. And there's his whole, the way he's standing in the doorway. Yes. He's in his dressing room in this picture. And I love, I love his, his Eddie Ryan clothes. all the time (laughs) oh and here's how he looked when we did our act together this is us in the waldorf astoria can you see it that's very well isn't it great great that's the way he laughed like that he laughed with me every night on the stage i miss that face and i miss that laugh but we all have to go on when when you entered Funny Girl, yes. was any of the original cast still in the show, or was everybody replaced? Um, the mother uh, went to England with Barbara, so we had a different lady, and some of the ladies at uh, at the gambling table, yes. they were replaced, and. Uh, Nobody and, else. And Sidney Chaplin was replaced by Johnny yeah. Desmond. Johnny Desmond, yes. Yes. Yeah, he wasn't there. Yeah, so it was basically a new company. Basically, basically. sort of. But the, the um, of course, the chorus yes. stayed. They're yes. very important. You know, the bride number is... Very the important. Tenor, the man it was the tenor. Of course, I'm I'm so old. It was it 51 years ago? It's <laughs> hard to remember everybody's name in the cast, but he was a great tenor, and it, and the bride's number was oh, it was so hysterical, and the man that played Ziegfeld was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. When when you went into it opening night, December 27th, <laughs> were you aware, or did you even think about? This huge mes- musical is resting on my shoulders. No, as a matter of fact, you know who, what I thought? As I came down those stairs from my dressing room and crossed over the stage to the other side, to s- stage left, to come on the stage, all I could think about was Ethel Norman. Because I had spoken to her, you know, so many times we were friends. And she had played every theater in New York. So she had played the Winter Garden many times. And she was the only one I could think of. I thought of her only. Isn't that strange? (laughs) No, that's very interesting. That must have kept you from a rising feeling of fear or panic. This was your first legitimate engagement. Wasn't it the first time you were in a, a play or a musical? Oh, no, we had no. done, no, no. No, not true. We, had, we did uh, Bells Are Ringing right before we went right. into Funny Girl. So it was not and, your first experience. We were the king and queen of summer stock at that time because of the Jack Parr popularity and Ed Sullivan. They all, we did all of the summer stock circuit. So we had done a lot of, shows by the time we got to Funny Girl. So you were and, an experienced stage performer when you well, yes, your entrance yeah. that night. You were yeah. no, nothing, anything but a novice. Well, you know, um, 
I'm fortunate in the fact that I've never been nervous because if I'm sure of what I'm doing, there is no reason for nerves. And I'm always sure. I always make sure that I'm sure. <laughs> so that when I go out there, I'm sure. <laughs> was, but was one week enough time for you to well, yeah. the part? I got it. We got it together. We did work hard. Yes. The, all of those numbers, I, th I think it was um, 18 songs and 20 some odd changes of wardrobe. And it was a, a lot to learn. The wardrobe changes too, you know. First you start with the rudimentary things of the play itself and the dialogue, and then they introduce you to the clothes <laughs> for the dress rehearsal. I had to be fitted in different outfits and oh, it was all beautiful. It was like a, a dream. It was a dream. It's still a dream. Still a dream. But oh, you know, yeah. You played Fanny longer than anybody else ever has. I know. Aren't I lucky? Aren't you are the record holder. I'm the luckiest girl in the world. <laughs> the I the greatest am. star. And the greatest star. <laughs> oh, the yeah. Greatest star. But Isn't it? But, when but, you were doing it for 18 months, did you discover new things about her? Did you Every performance. Her? Every performance I found a relationship to somebody else's line or somebody else's feeling. Every performance I found new relationships to the plot. And it was wonderful. So it never got tired in 18 months. No, it, it, it's funny girl should never be changed in any other performance. It should keep that resilience of the writing of the people that planned it in the first place. The wonderful, wonderful Julie Stein and Bob Merrill. Those men wrote their heart out for that show because they were working, don't forget, with Fanny Bryce's daughter. Yes. Who was married to Mr. Stark. And it was important to them to make it wonderful and it will always remain wonderful, so long as no one tries to change it. But I, you, I know you haven't been to New York, so you haven't seen the current revival. And this show is not about that. But I have seen it, and they did make changes. Uh, I don't think any of the changes were for the better. So I, I think what you're saying is, the show is a masterwork, leave it alone. God love you for saying that, because if it's, if it's great, you mustn't mess with the great. You must leave it great and try to create it the way it's created. And nobody seems to want to do that anymore. You know, they always want to reinterpret or reimagine. There yes. was a big article in the New York Times about the choreographer of Funny Girl reimagining Funny Girl for modern times. Reimagining what? It doesn't need to be reimagined. No, and I do understand that they changed also the time zone that it takes place in? Uh, Not at no, the I, end eighteen no, thing? I, no, I don't think they tampered with that, but they Who Are You Now? One of your great numbers is now a yeah. duet, for instance. It's a duet out of soul. The introduction to Cornet Man, that brilliant introduction, gone. No. Gone. Um the his, his is the music that makes me dance, that great torch song, is not delivered as a number on a stage, but as a private meditation in her house. Oh, please come back. <laughs> so, oh, there you are. Yeah. So, so now, what did you say? I said, the music, uh, his is the music that makes me dance, is yes. not done as a number on a stage. It's done as a kind of private monologue that she sings almost to herself in her own house. So it's, it's, it's been rethought. She sings it in her own house? Yes, it's not done on a stage. Instead of in the spotlight on the stage? Correct. You know, that's the, but how, how? That's the magic part of the show. That's the real magic right there because, okay, I, I, I don't know if Barbara wore the same wardrobe, but just let me say, 
I came out in a white grow grain coat. The bottom of the coat just came to the knees and the grow grain pattern went up and down. Then just past the, the uh, lap where you would sit down, all of this terrible happening in her life and she sits at this table. It's the work table that you, we all use in the show. Yes. And everybody leaves and she sings the verse. I add two and two, the most simple addition and swear that the critics are lying. I'm a much better comic than mathematician, 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 because I'm better on stage now. At that point, you reach into your pocket and you unhook what we call a stripper hook. It's a great big silk hook and eye, and you can feel it. And I would feel it, and as I would undo it, I would stand and stand and as I would stand and walk forward and the spotlight comes on your face and the black dress drops down to your feet and you have a black sequin top and a black crepe dress all the way down to your feet. It's magic. It's what you live for in the theater. That magic moment of how did that happen? You know? How did she come out in a short coat with white fur and stand up in a full-length black dress with a black top? It's unbelievable. And to, to not do that, it, it destroys the plot. It, 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 it undercuts crazy. this great moment. It undercuts yes. the theatricality. Yes, and she, she goes out there and sings because she's on the stage. You realize that she's you know, transformed and she's doing her, her Ziegfeld spot. And so she sings it and her heart is breaking. I don't know how it could, music, it makes me dance. You're just killing me. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, they didn't understand it. Who are you now is so gorgeous as a solo. And I've yes, heard yeah. you sing it. It's a duet now. It undercuts. No, it, can't, it can't be a duet because they have a fight. She gets mad at him because he didn't show up at the opening night when she's doing Private Schwartz. He didn't show up. So she says, where have you been? Well, you weren't here for my... And, and he gets mad at her and he said, you know, like, I got a life, whatever the lines are. And and then she realizes that she's she's treading on this man's personal... Um, you know, she's interfering with him. What are you doing when you're not with me you know she, she and she realizes it and then she looks at him and puts her hands on his shoulder and looks in the mirror you know the it's a pretend mirror but it looks out to the audience and which is great you're looking at at yourself in the mirror mentally but and then you're singing out to the audience who are you now now that you're mine I mean, it's still, how can you not break somebody's heart? But it's her song. It's and her, it's her song. song. And it's to him saying, what, you know, like, what have I done? Are you something more than you were before? You know, all the lyrics match. Is like, what have I done to you? You can't sing it together. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, I do. So yes. much better. So vivid. Yeah. It's so vivid. Someone better for my love is the last line. And how can you make that together? I mean, it shouldn't be a duet. Is it a duet or does she sing it to him? Because she sings it, it, it to him. It, how do you make it a duet? a duet? It becomes a duet. And uh, it, it's under, it undermines what you've just been telling us. Uh, how, yeah. did you, how did you approach uh, Don't Rain on My Parade? Was that a uh, number? I love that number. And uh, and this um, 
uh, as you're looking at, at the, the backdrop behind me? Yes. That is the final curtain of Funny Girl forever. That was the Broadway theater. That curtain that you're looking at is the house curtain, not the show curtain. It was, they were standing and screaming so loud. It was our final performance and the theater was full of people and they wouldn't stop applauding. And I couldn't say goodbye. And I climbed under the house curtain, which has a bar all the way across the bottom. And it weighs a couple of hundred pounds, I guess. I picked it up and put it on my shoulder and came out under the curtain, you'll see me. I've got a bouquet of flowers and the curtains on my shoulder and I'm waving goodbye <laughs> to the people. I couldn't say goodbye. And that curtain is the, it's the house curtain, you know, yeah. behind the curtain, behind the house curtain. That, when they drop that house curtain, that's everybody out. Everybody out. But behind, yeah, behind the curtain is the show curtain. When it closes and the, you know the show is over. And then you, everybody takes their bows, etc. And the show curtain closes again. And then, bang, the house curtain comes down. And that's the one I crawled under. And that photograph was taken by a wonderful man that followed Phil and I around taking our picture everywhere. His name was Oscar Abalafia. He was a beautiful man. And I tried to get in touch with him one day. And then I found out he had just passed away right before I tried to get in touch with him, which is some way always the way. And anyway, he had taken a picture of every scene of Funny Girl that night. And I sent them to Mark Sendroff, every picture in a big box. And he has all those pictures, every scene. And that scene, he made me a blanket. That's a blanket that you're looking at. He oh. made me a blanket for my bed. And I said, Mike said, oh, we mustn't, we've got to frame it. You know, we, and Mark said, no, no, that's a golden moment in Broadway history. I want you to lie under it forever. <laughs> so there it is. There it is. That's, yeah. that, that commemorates the last performance of Funny Girl on Broadway. It had moved by then to the Broadway Theater. July right. 1st, 1967. I've heard, I don't know, maybe if you know, there's some bootleg recordings of some of the numbers that night. I'm the Greatest Star, which I've listened to over and over again. Somebody recorded it. Of course, oh. the, sound, the sound isn't the greatest, but you can tell the power of the performance and the audience response to you in that number was just overwhelming. You could it was overwhelming, that. wasn't it? Yes, overwhelming. That's why I had to crawl under the curtain. I, I wouldn't stop screaming and applauding. <laughs> it was so wonderful. I'll never feel that again. And I, I hold it so dear that when I hear people... Oh, who's that lady? <laughs> okay, now we're, we've got the sound back. Uh, Mimi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay, you. And I, and I can hear you. I can hear you. Oh, uh, good. That, that last note of rain on, don't rain on my parade is extraordinary. Did you have to do special training to be able to hit that note every no. time? Uh, no. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, my uncle Robert... Um, he studied in La Scala, and of course, he always gave me some of the points. But before that, when I was nine years old, he took me to a singing teacher, and the teacher said, he listened to me sing, and he said, said to my uncle, you want me to teach this girl to sing, and she sings already like a canary? You want me to sing a bird, take a bird and teach it to sing? Get out of here. So, and then I was really fortunate, Phil and I went to Hollywood. And I got to meet 
um, Mario Lanza's voice coach. And he taught me Madam Butterfly. And he taught me um, uh, O Mio Babino Caro. And we put those in our act. And he was a lovely man. And I, I'm, I, I'm um, having a senior moment. I know his name so well, and suddenly pff, it's gone. <laughs> but I mean, I, I say his name all the time. I, I don't know but, why I can't but, think of it. But, but Mimi, basically, your voice was just a natural. You were just born um, a gift of song. Well, yeah. And ever since I was uh, four years old, I sang on a stage in New West Minute. I'm born in Vancouver, Canada. I'm a Canadian canary. <laughs> and I sang on the stage with, with a dolly trunk and sang Chattanooga Choo Choo. <laughs> what, what was the most challenging moment in Funny Girl, either in terms of acting or in terms of it, you know, it, It's not just a comedy, it's a dramedy. Yes. It's, it's heart rendering. If, if you... If you read it right, you know, if, if you do it and, and, you, and you don't make it like cocky, you know, I'm not going to be cocky with this. It breaks my heart, but I don't care. You know, no, you got to suffer. You have to suffer in the places where the person that wrote the story makes the suffering. You have to go with that. You can't fight it. And I, I didn't find that hard to do. Because uh, my life for heartbreak hasn't been easy. And um, I felt everything that I did in that show. But I loved the show. And I loved it the longer I did it. I could have done it forever and never been unhappy. Really? I never thought a moment about anything else but that. But the blend of comedy and pathos is something that's deep within you because i yes. to do some research for tonight's interview i've been looking at some tapes of yours you're, you're wildly funny you cracked me up it's not politically correct when you did the japanese woman on oh, yes. the girl yes. I mean, it's not we're not supposed to do that anymore you know no, no, no but when we did but, that but, but it's brilliant it's phil and i would get followed at the airports by japanese people and they wanted they say sayonara sayonara and they would run after us and get our autograph they weren't hurt by it they loved it they Good. thought it was hysterical and you're, then you're a fabulous mimic and you <laughs> crack people up but there's another side to you and there's that there is a pathos and there is a melancholy and a that, melancholy, yeah. and that that was perfect for Fanny Bryce. You can't just play her as bright and chirpy. That's not the character. No, because, and you know from Mr. Zegva when he takes all the feathers and things in the film. Have you ever seen the film? Yes. Yeah, and he takes all the stuff off. And she said, even at the at Henry Street, I, I, I was allowed to wear, you know, pretty things. And he strips her of all the prettiness and makes it says, now sing. And she sings. Uh, the one that Barbara sings at the end of the movie. My man. My man. Yes. Yeah. That was Fanny's real heartbreak song. And that's... That, should that show, song have been in the show? Or, or was it... No, I, I think that when Julie Stein wrote uh, Music That Makes Me Dance, that was that's the number that replaces... My man. And, My then, man. The, and then the film drops music that makes me dance and replaces it with my man right yeah which which, which uh, for me i missed it you missed music that makes I, me I miss music because it's such a thrilling it's a thrilling song and for no one in the in the world of m motion pictures got to hear it you know no, what i mean no it, it, it's it's not well known it's not one of the best the known show. Songs the show. No, these songs no, it's not. It's not, know. it's not known today. It no, it, you you don't know. Private Schwartz was is is really funny with the with the girls tap dancing and everything, and you you, you don't know uh, Henry Street and and um, the songs that are missing. You don't know those unless you've seen the show.
unless you've seen the show. The movie yeah, is not. The movie the is beautiful. Oh, the movie is is a gem. Barbara's just marvelous in it. I love her so much. And we've never gotten to know each other very well. We knew each other a long time ago, but she doesn't remember, and I don't blame her. <laughs> she was opening with the Liberace, and she and I were in this little shop, and I, she was picking out a dress, and, and we were laughing. I, I remember, I reminded her of it, and she said, I don't remember that. <laughs> Of course, she wouldn't. It was a long time ago. After you opened in Funny Girl, did you ever hear from her? But, no, but she did leave me a giant blue marble egg. <laughs> oh, she did? Yeah, you know, the blue marble egg is a symbol in the show, and white roses. But she left me this big blue marble egg, and I had this lovely home in Malibu, and I had it in my cabinet, and the sun came in, because it, the dining room was floor to ceiling uh, glass, and the sun would come in, and it took all the blue and made a gray marble egg. <laughs> the sun drained all the blue out of this, this big egg. Oh, I, I was so angry. <laughs> but that was her gift to that you was her as, gift as a yeah. successor. I loved it. As a successor. Now, yeah. I want everybody who's listening to us to go to YouTube and to see you perform two numbers from the show, from the Ed Sullivan show. Oh, yes. Get to see you perform Private Schwartz and then Who Are You Now? And the juxtaposition of the riotously funny comic number and you do a fabulous Yiddish accent. And then we see you transform in front of us from comedy to drama. It's an amazing transformation. So everybody watching and you want to see the genius of Mimi Hines, it's very easy to find on YouTube. Her performance on the Ed Sullivan Show, Private Schwartz, riotously funny and, and achingly beautiful. Who are you now? The one, two. You could see why you got the part from that. You could see why that Thank part you, was Mr. yours. That Thank you with all my heart. That part was yours. It was. Yeah, absolutely belonged to you. Now, after after the show closed, you were not done with Funny Girl. Didn't you play it in other cities? Uh, let me see. I <laughs> No, not really. Only one place, oh, quite a few months later, there was a man that ran a club over in um, oh, some little town in Jersey. I can't quite remember the name of it. Anyway, this is where I met Mark Sundroff because this man hired me to do Funny Girl. But we, we started to, you know, I picked up, I took some people from the show with me and we got into rehearsal and this man had no, no sets, no furniture, nothing. What are you going to, how are you going to, it was amazing. So a friend of mine went out with a truck and he went to other stores and he bought furniture to, to, to fill in on the stage. And that's where Mark Sendoff came to see me the first time I met him because the marquee said steaks, chops, and Mimi Hines and Funny Girl. <laughs> so, so you did do it. You did do it. Yeah, I did it, but it was a joke. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I hadn't had a great pianist, and that was Russ Kassoff, I, I would have never been able to do it. But you didn't do it in Las Vegas? There was, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Um, quite, yes. I, um, gee, I almost forgot that. Yeah. That was um, about a year later, we took it to Anaheim. And Phil and I rented Anita Louise's home in Holmby Hills, and we stayed there and drove to Anaheim every night and did the show with um, with the man that did it with me here Johnny. in Vegas. Uh, no, um, Desmond. No, uh, uh, Anthony George, Tony George. Anyway, um, the bosses here at the Riviera Hotel 
were thinking about getting Funny Girl into the hotel, but they wouldn't do it because the boss said, no, we're not going to have, have any show here that deals with a gambler that goes to jail. They didn't want that. Then the boss came to see Phil and I in Anaheim, and he bought it, bang, right away. He loved it. And he said, it doesn't matter about the, the guy that goes to jail. I want those kids, you know, because we were from television. And, of course, Vegas knew television more than they knew Broadway. So we played here uh, four or five months, I think it was. Riviera. Was it, yeah. was, there, was it a tab or reduced version, or was it the full? Oh, okay. Phil and Julie sat and corrected and put in different things in the dialogue so that Phil would cover everything that Fanny did with uh, with Nicky Arnstein, like the man in uh, our town. He yeah. stood at the wings. And he said, gee, here's a postcard from Fanny. Oh, Fanny and Nick are, yeah, just like that. Yeah. Fanny and Nick are so-and-so. And they and so, and filled in the parts we had to take out and put into dialogue because we needed to cut a half hour. And that's a lot. Yeah. And one night, it were, <laughs> one night, it was New Year's Eve. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And the next night was the night after New Year's Eve. And Phyllis standing at the wing doing this thing with a postcard and a balloon on a string comes down and it's right in front of his face and he takes it like this and goes with it and keeps talking and goes to the other wing and all <laughs> it was hysterically funny and everybody in the audience was screaming with laughter because it was the day after new year's eve and the balloon came <laughs> down. you know it was one that was late <laughs> it came late yeah yeah. Did the did audiences in Las Vegas like Funny Girl? Did they enjoy the show? Oh, they loved it. And one night I'm putting a uh, powdering down. I was finished with the show. I was kind of redoing my makeup to, to go out into the public. And Phil says, there's someone here to see you, Mimi, at the door. And I looked and I said, yeah, who? And the guy said, Suffering Shakatesh. And it was Mel Blank. And he had been in an accident. And he had climbed three flights of stairs to come up to my dressing room to tell me he loved the show and Phil. It was beautiful. Mel Blank, because I used to Im impersonate him on television. Yeah. I used to do Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and, you know, it just for fun. Yeah. on those talk shows that we'd go on, you know. But he knew I did that, and he knew I loved him and, and all those voices he did. And he came after having an accident, and he was, like, on crutches. I don't know how he got up the stairs. But what a but tribute yeah. to you. What a tribute to you. What a tribute to Funny Girl. I think, what a tribute. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Funny Girl has done a lot for my memory and my future memories. It's the one thing that lives truly in my heart that I did Broadway with my love and was able to be successful at that. And then, you know, after that, <laughs> we had a week before my birthday. We were out of the show on the 7th, I think it was. And now, a few days later, it's my birthday, and Phil hired a handsome cab. He says, we're going out for your birthday. And the handsome cab is going down Fifth Avenue. Well, they weren't allowed to do that in those days. They do now. But in those days, no, it was against the rules. But Phil must have taken care of the guy and got him to go down Fifth Avenue. And we're handsome cabbing, and it's great, and it's my birthday, and I'm in a handsome cab on Fifth Avenue. And he's trotting along, you know, and then he makes a left turn and goes down this street. I don't know which one, I forget. And um, I see one of the kids from the show. And I said, oh, look, there's, you know, one of the chorus people, another one. There's another one. 
So I just thought it was a coincidence. And then the handsome cab pulls up at this restaurant that was very famous then. It's called Lutece. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I'll never forget it as long as I live. I walked in there and the whole cast was at a table, a great big table, wishing me happy birthday, holding up their glasses, cheering me on. The whole cast, Phil had gotten them all together to celebrate my birthday. And then out of nowhere, seated at another table, <sighs> Sidney Poitier walks up to me like he knew me forever. And he says, Mimi, you were great. And I think he had seen the show the night before with the um, um, uh, 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 lady I love. Um, she was in uh, that movie with him with the nuns. Uh, Lily, Lily Scala. Lily yes. Scala. She had, yes, Lily Scala. She, she used to say to Phil and I, she said, came to see Funny Girl, and I do believe that she brought Sydney with her, and that's why he said I was, we were great, because I think he saw it, and then he didn't come to the dressing room, because if he had, he'd be bombarded by people. He's Sydney Poitier, you know, and he'd never get away, so he probably scooted out quietly because it was a few days later that I saw him. And Lilia always said, if you were in Europe now, they'd be throwing roses and flowers on the stage to you. It would be covered with flowers. And I said, well, they don't throw flowers in America, in America, I guess. But she was wonderful. And when he embraced me, I'll never forget it. I mean, Sidney Poitier on my birthday. God. And he embraced me. And then when he passed away this year, it was real heartbreak. I loved him. <laughs> I didn't know him real well. Just that embrace and that beautiful smile. And I loved him. Everybody has memories of, of Sidney Poitier, just like yours. Yeah. Universally yes. beloved figure. Oh, God. It gives Can me you? chill to think of such a great person as that. A wonderful actor wonderful depth i mean and, and when he laughed and smiled it was beautiful in that um, movie with spencer tracy and Catherine, coming to dinner oh he's blessed when he talks to his father it's a wonderful yes. scene yeah yes it's a wonderful scene can uh, uh, about funny girl did you did it ever cross your mind or did you think about why this great show was never revived on Broadway until this year. All these years, every Gypsy's revived every other minute, it seems. Funny Girl is a great show, never revived. Well, I, I, I would only say it must have been because, I mean, there were a couple of people that tried to do it and it folded on the road uh, because it isn't just a comedy show. Like I said, it's a dramedy. You must be able to handle both both of these. Um, it's like juggling. You know, you got to catch a ball here and catch a ball there. And not a lot of people, uh, I think, in the entertainment business have that quality. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I'm but think also, I think the shadow of Barbara Streisand did cover over the show. Yeah, there yes. Was legend that oh, only Barbara Streisand could play this part. Not true. You played the part right after her and proved yes. another approach would work. But nobody was willing to take a chance. There no. was great fear. Well, after that all, they could live up to the expectation. Well, and, and the movie had come out by then when other people tried to do it, which, you know, the movie is very, very strong. And I mean, Barbara won the um, together with Catherine Hepburn, the, the Academy Award, that's really something. Yes, that is, yes, yeah. it is. Now, you, uh, there's so much else to talk about, but I want to open it to the house for questions. But you did another time, you stepped into a role that in its original 
version was, you would think, unbeatable. But boy, you put your own spin on it. When you succeeded, so to speak, Ethel Chate singing Broadway Baby in Folly <laughs> at Encores, I thought, whoever is going to sing Broadway Baby has a tough act to follow. Because if you saw the original, Ethel Chate was just magnificent. And there you come on and you did it again. You made it your own. <laughs> I did copy a little piece from her because oh, Mark, yeah. Mark uh, told me about her and, sh and showed me a little film of her doing that number and uh, when she kicks the cat. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's, a, that's an homage to Ethel Chate. <laughs> yes, yes. Did you, did you, I did it did a little you, harder than her and a little meaner. <laughs> <laughs> did you get any... After I left Funny Girl, Phil and I went right out in I Do, I Do for, uh, for um, uh, uh, you know, the big producer then. Uh, I've got his telegram on my wall. David Merrick? Uh, uh, Merrick, yes. And he, he sent us this telegram and he, and he gave us a Christmas gift with beautiful silver box from Tiffany's. And on the telegram, it says, I love you too, people. And so it's wonderful. And, and he said to Phil and I personally, you know why I love you and Mamie? And Phil said, why? He says, because you're not greedy. Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> all of the acts that were for him, they were greedy. You know, they wanted that money. And, and yeah. Phil and I, we've always made money with our act so that isn't what was you know forward in our minds and consequently when we were in funny girl we had signed for the third year and when anthony george came to my dressing room and said i just went to the box office to buy tickets for my family for opening night and they told me there's no show that night and I said, I didn't know. What do you mean there's no show? And I didn't even look on the board. The notice was up that we were going to close so there wouldn't be any show. And they had already fitted him in his tuxedo and his cape, and they'd already, you know, put all of his clothes together. So he thought he was opening. I thought he was opening. But no, uh, the people that were making the film came to... Central Park when Barbara did her lovely concert there and they found that the show is still running and I understand that the agreements are if a show is still running and you're paying uh, the company that's going to produce it you're the they're paying money for that and they don't want to keep it is that show still running no close it because we don't want to keep paying every month for the show to be open. So, so, in other words, Funny Girl could have run longer. Yes. It could have run longer. It could have run longer. And guess what? They had to pay us off. Oh. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Is that amazing? Anyway. And, yeah, uh, yeah, for the year. Oh, really? For the rest of the year? Yeah. Yeah, then we signed for new year, another year. So... But but I, after talking to you, I sense you care more about doing the show than about getting paid. Oh, I tell you, I would have stayed in it forever if somebody hadn't said, oh, we're closing, you know. <laughs> I, I truly love that show. It's, it's kind of sickening, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no, it is not. It is not. Uh, when you did uh, uh, Follies at, at the Encores, did Stephen Sondheim talk to you? Did you get any yeah. note from him? He talked to me at the Sitz Probe. And I was um, <laughs> overwhelmed. And he sent his assistant over after I did the Broadway baby. And his assistant came over and said, Mr. Sondheim wants me to tell you that's the best rendition he ever heard of Broadway baby. And he wants you to know that. And I said, oh, God, thank you. Wow. So on the way out, of the sits probe as all the musicians left and everything, which is an exciting moment of show business when you're surrounded by that orchestra on the sits probe. It's every or every trombone, trumpet, symphony drums, and you're in the middle of it doing your number. I mean, it makes chills go up into my head. It's so wonderful. And so at the door, 
Mr. Sondheim was standing at the door and I said, hi, Mr. Sondheim, do you remember me? He said, are you kidding? I was in that theater more times than you know. Of course I remember you from Funny Girl. And then my uh, I, a gentleman that was working with me that week uh, had run into Sondheim in the wings of the uh, theater we were in. And uh, he said, Mr. Sondheim, can I take a picture with you, please? And I know you don't like pictures. He said, that's okay. He says, because I'm here with Mimi Hines. And he said to this young man, I love her. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Wonderful. Yes. Oh, it's that's wonderful and well deserved because that Broadway baby is terrific and our audience can also YouTube it and see you performing it. It's Isn't that great? Yeah, that's on YouTube rendition. too. Yeah. Terrific yes. rendition. Now you've you were saying before the show, you've been touring and working show businesses in your veins. You've been working for 70 years. Yes. And you've been touring and you've been in countless shows you were a year in hello dolly i do i do sugar baby sugar no no right the list yeah. goes on and on yeah we did we did we did hello dolly in china we did it in um singapore and hong kong and taipei in taiwan and it was just amazing they got all the jokes every joke and in taiwan on the opening night we had the uh, lady of uh, the wife of the president and then on closing night we had both of them and i went into the audience with the mic at the end of hello dolly and and they sang with me Hello, Dari. <laughs> I'm doing my act again. <laughs> uh, speaking of acts, before I turn it over to, to our audience, is there any truth to the rumor that if all goes well, about a year from now, you can come to New York at Feinstein's 54 Below for a 90th birthday cabaret celebration? Well, I've been dreaming of it if I live that long and if I'm still in good condition, because thinking about getting on the airplane right now is not a good idea to me. <laughs> no, not right now, but it'll be a year from yeah, now. But, but thinking a year from now, I, I hope to do it. Let's say that. I hope. You would I have hope. an audience, believe me, there would be a big audience in New York who would come out to see you. I'm, that would be I'm lovely. I'm hoping. Yeah that you sing still all the time. Oh, I do, I yeah. Sing as much as I can anymore. And I'm, I'm doing pretty good, I can still sing. You can still sing? Yeah, I, I don't know if I can hit that B flat again like I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I can uh, work up to it. Okay, if well, I'm well, enough yeah. this year, I can get it done. We will, we will look I have, forward I haven't sung since the 80th birthday. Well, you have but, not. Not, not my whole act. No, I, I did um, I did a Sondheim show in Palm Springs, uh, Little Night Music. And, uh, of course, that one at, at uh, Follies at City Center. But to do my, uh, my own act that I do, I haven't sung that at all. So I would have to refresh all that. But I, I, I my... Um, my beautiful Mark Sendroff, he produced that show on my 80th birthday, and he chose the numbers for me to sing because he knows what I sing best and what he wanted to hear, and it was excellent. I mean, it just came off beautiful, and I had not sung for 11 years when I did that 80th birthday. I have a carotid artery surgery. I have six bolts in my ankle from dancing. I have busted knees from doing the kid in the candy store with Phil. He'd say, I need a kid. And I'd say, big kid, little kid. He'd say, little kid, bang. And I'd go drop immediately to my knees in the knee drop finish, right? And somebody said to me, you got bad knees from doing that? Why didn't you wear knee pads? Who knew about knee pads? I didn't know. All I know is singing and laughing. But as 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 you're talking, Mimi, I'm reminded of 
the lyric of one of Sondheim's great songs, I'm still here. Oh, isn't that great? Well, but you you're know, still here. Yeah, but you know, that's kind of on the nose. You know what I mean? I've never sung that song because of that. It's on the nose. It's too on the nose. Too, too on the nose. Yeah. But you're living it. I'm still here. You don't have to yeah, sing but... it. <laughs> With that, uh, Mark and Magda, let's open the floor to questions from our audience. Okay. Can I just ask the first question, Mimi? Um, sure. First of all, how did you meet Phil? And if you could tell the story that you told me about being married to him 20 years, could you elaborate and talk about Phil a little bit? Talk about Phil? Yes. How you met? Oh, how we met was wonderful. It was wonderful. We met in Alaska. I was up there uh, doing my act uh, in a place called the Silver Slipper. And he was doing his act. I was 18. Uh, he was at a place called the Ambassador. But let me get to how we met first. Okay. In Alaska, because of the servicemen there, um, they had a club outside of the in-town perimeter clubs. You'd go outside of that and you could stay open all night. So I went with, with somebody else, and I forget who, and we went to this club called Fort Starnes and I went to see an act that I had run into in the Pacific Northwest named Jad Harrod and his review. So we were, I was watching it with the people that I went with, the chorus girls, I think they were, but uh, just friends. And I saw this man across the way and someone had sent me a big bottle of champagne. And I, I saw Phil over there at, a, at another seat, table. And he was looking at me and I was looking, I called him over and I said, hey, how about sharing this champagne with me? I'll never drink it all, you know. So he introduced himself and we were talking. I, I drank the champagne and he drank the champagne. And then I had to go wee wee <laughs> from all the champagne. And I got up and I said, I'll see you in a minute. And I went into the ladies room. And I was 18, right? And champagne really wasn't on my list. <laughs> I don't think I had ever had it before. And so I, I did my little wee-wee, and then I came out, and I, I was sitting on this table in front of a to toilet stall. And this girl was talking to me and putting on her lipstick, and I was talking, I don't, and I was swinging my feet. And I was swinging my feet and swinging my feet. And I swung my feet so hard. And I was really loaded on this champagne. And I flung myself into the stall and put my head in the toilet and knocked myself out. So they ran and they got Phil because they didn't know what I was with. I wasn't with him. But, okay, 24 hours later, I woke up in an upper bunk. And I hear these girls all saying, well, I told this SOB what to do, what it is, he wouldn't do this to me. And, I, and they're saying all these swear, swear, swear words and things I've never heard. And it was unbelievable. I thought, oh, my God, my mother told me this. I've been shanghai because before I went to Alaska, she said, be careful, Mimi, they shanghai pretty girls like you. <laughs> So I thought I was Shanghai, and then they, they saw that I was awake, and they said, oh, look, the kid's awake, and they brought me a cup of coffee, and I said, where am I? Oh, you're in the back of Fort Starnes. This is where they put us up. We're the dancers and, and the strippers. So I was in this room with all these strippers and dancers, and I said, how did I get here? I, I have a hotel room, you know, downtown in, in Anchorage. And they said, well, your boyfriend brought you in. I said, boyfriend? I don't have any boyfriend. She said, that man, Phil Ford, he brought you in here because he didn't know where to take you. So he took me to this, <laughs> this back wooden, you know, made of logs, log cabin with all these strippers. And I said, well, how do I get out of here? And uh, 
and they showed me how to get a cab and everything. And then when I got to my hotel room, Phil called me and said, did you make it home okay, you know, to the hotel? And that's where I met him. I met him and I didn't even know I met him. <laughs> he had left me with these strippers because <laughs> he didn't know where to put me. <laughs> and then later, of course, my joint, putting it gently, the silver slipper closed and the guy ran away with all the money and I didn't get paid. And so Phil, the place where he was working at the ambassador, he had a toe tap dancer working with him and she broke her ankle and she couldn't toe tap dance anymore. So he called me, he said, how about doing an act with me? I heard you sing, because he did come and see me sing. And he said, you're great, and come on and work with me and sing. And he brought me to the guy that he was working for at the ambassador in Anchorage. And the man said, hey, Phil, all that stuff you do before you bring the girl out, forget that. He says, that's my act. He says, forget it, bring her on right away. <laughs> So we started doing an act together right there. He had all the material and I started doing what, you know, what. He, and I had, when I was working in Vancouver, I, I worked the theater and, and a couple of clubs and, and uh, I had stolen a couple of jokes from a couple of, you know, and just to beef up the singing, you got to have some laughs along the way. So he saw the comedy bend in me as much as anybody did, and he really recognized it. And then, like in the song, I taught her everything she knows. And he did. I wish now, he would. Mark, you would ask Amy, 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 let me just comment. I, I taught her everything she knows from Funny Girl. Yeah. In the original is in act one. In this yes. revision, it doesn't appear until act two, where it doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make sense at all. Not at all. Oh, but that's where it is. It's in Act Two. Eddie Ryan, Phil, sings it with the mother. In Act One. In Act One. It's in Act she, Two now. Okay. She Other sings questions? <laughs> yeah, we have a question from Sandy uh, Bangle that uh, the song, There Are Two Sides to Everything. Oh, yeah. She was wondering if you could share the backstory of your recording of that number and how it came to be. The two sides to everything was in a, um, it was in a television movie. And I think it was uh, something to do with the, uh, the, ra the rabbit that goes down the, um, was it? I, I, I can't quite remember. I know, I think it was, Jimmy Durante was in it, and it was um, about the, um, you know, the girl that goes through the rabbit hole. Alice. Alice, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. That's where it was from, yeah. And that's how I recorded it. I loved it. I thought it was cute as heck. And uh, it's a good song. Two sides to everything. I th and you know something, uh, that's a very good uh, movie, and they never play it back. I've never seen it played again. And I often wonder why, because Dur Durante was in it. I remember it. It was really w quite quite well done. And uh, maybe they don't play it because of something about the, the music may be owned by, you know, some other property or something like that. Because they, they don't, you know, they play a lot of old films that are great, that have a lot of music in them. I don't know why that one doesn't come up. That was fun. I think we can give it back to you, Foster, for a wrap up. Okay. Uh, Mamie, this has been so special to talk to you from Las Vegas. Yeah. You like living in Las Vegas, or would you like to be here with us in New York? I'd like to be with you in New York. <laughs> well, we hope to have you. Hope to have you when you come to New York. 
And just to say, uh, Russ Kassoff is uh, on listening to you. So you might want oh, to Russ, my darling Russ. Yes, yes, yes. So it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Mimi. And we look forward to seeing you in New York. And you'll come to the Lambs and we'll celebrate you. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> I got a lot of work to do if I'm going to do it. Yeah, start, start tomorrow. Well, yeah, I have to pray that I make it. <laughs> you will. You know, I'll be 89 in a few days. In July the, July the 17th. And leave us not forget, it's my honey's 103rd birthday today. Happy birthday to him and happy birthday to you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And, now and I thank all my friends out there that are listening. Yes, I think uh, unmute yourself if you're a friend of uh, Mimi's. Anybody else? Bill, Bill Minson. Oh, Bill Minson. Hiya, Bill. I love Hi, you, Mimi. So beautiful. He's my reverend. Hi, honey. How are you? You look beautiful, Mimi. Oh, thanks, I Bill. Love I love you too. I've Ooh, known him hi. since he was 16. <laughs> wow. Bob Poe here in Los Angeles. Who's in Los Angeles? Bob Poe. Oh, hiya, Poe. Hey. Bob Poe. <laughs> There's my Poe. Hello, darling. I've known him since he was 16, too. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you on your birthday. Oh, I hope so. I hope so, darling. I love you all. I miss you all. Uh, Damn this pandemic. I mean, it really closed me in. Uh, well, I used to go, Phil and, I mean, um, Mike and I would get in the car and go down to Palm Springs or L.A. and visit people, especially my friend Kay Ballard, who I miss so dearly. I loved her with all my heart. What a funny lady. You want to talk about a funny lady and a great singer? That's Kay Ballard. Mm. You know, they uh, Julie Stein had spoken to her about doing Funny Girl years before it came about. He was just writing the songs. She told me that, and, and I believe it. I loved her. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, Mimi. Be well. See, speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Forrest. It was a delight talking to you. Thank and you. Pleasure.